So now it's going to be a bit of background material on kernels and Hilbert spaces, regularization theory, and we might get a little bit into the issue of efficient algorithms. My guess is we'll probably get stuck somewhere around here, and the rest will be for next week. So this is a fair amount of material that we're covering here. It's probably about, let's say, 10 years worth of, you know, Kernel's research. Highlights of that, or at least a very biased selection of some things that might be actually useful for you. Um, yeah. By all means, do interrupt and ask at any time. And in some cases, I've substituted mathematical rigor for simplicity, um, just because, well, I can't teach a full uh, function analysis class here. Uh, well, I could, but you wouldn't want to listen to it, I suppose. Um, so, okay, so the very basic object not to be scared of is what's called a Banach space. And that's just, you know, a normed vector space, and it may have infinite dimensions. So, any mathematician among you will probably now want to fail an entire me for it, but yeah, okay. Basically, think of an infinite dimensional normed vector space. So, um, linear functions on this, on, on these objects, well, they induce bottom forms. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So first of all, a vector space simply means that, you know, AX plus B is still in the space, this Banach space, if X and B are in that space, and furthermore, A is some scale. Basically, it means I can take sums, I can multiply, and I stay in the space. Now, I can therefore, you know, just on any arbitrary objects, define a linear function. Now, a linear function on objects in the Banach space needs to be linear in the arguments, right? So it therefore follows that I can, you know, pull the multiplication addition out. So get a times a from x plus f of b. Right? So that's how I can define a linear function. And furthermore, this is where things get interesting. Of course, these linear functions are now also in a vector space. Because I can multiply them by some number, or you get the real out of it, and I can add them together. Now, AF plus G applied to X is A times F of X plus G of X. Right? So this is basically we get linearity in that linear function space. So now we have a vector space of, on the x's and you know, the b's. And we have a vector space on the linear functions on that space. Okay. Important distinction. It's the linear functions themselves form their own space. And that space need not necessarily have anything to do with the x's a priori. We're going to see that this actually is very closely connected, but if I do that, I can just, you know, use the following shorthand. It's a bilinear form, because it's linear in f and linear in x. f of x, I just define this to be the inner product between f and x. And so for any arguments that we push it on the left and the right, you know, if we have linear combinations, we know how to evaluate it. Just use these two lines. Now, what are some meaningful back spaces? So for instance, L1, little L1. So that's the set of all the, you know, if I have a vector x that's in little L1, then it has the property that the sum over all i's, xi, absolute value of those i's, is less than infinity. Absolutely soundable series. I could have a series that's bounded. It doesn't have to be summable. That's something I'm going to call an infinity. And L2, well, there's square sum of them. And I can introduce corresponding norms with it just in the usual way. So here I sum all the squares of the terms, and then I take the square root. That's that. So back spaces are not scary. You can design very complicated Banach spaces, but a priori they're actually very simple objects. 
Now, what would be nice is if we could also induce a norm on the space of linear forms. Right? So the space of these f's and g's. And we already have a norm on the x's and b's. So can we induce a norm on the f and g's? Well, here's the trick how to get that. It's called a dual norm. It basically says that the norm of v is the loop over all u with the property that the norm of u is less equal than 1 in a probe between u and v. So in the case of uh, what we have before, it's basically we take that function a, linear function f of x, and I'm going to find the x for which f of x is the largest under the constraint that the length of x is less equal than 1. Okay, here are a couple of examples. So this is the unit ball in L2. This is the unit ball in L infinity. And this is the unit ball in L1. Well, in two dimensions. And I've picked, you know, the vector, black vector, that's, you know, my vector v. And I want the computer's norm. So in L2, well, what I can do is, the vector that, you know, maximizes the inner product between the black vector and this guy here, anything on that surface, is the one that's most aligned. And as a matter of fact, what I get out of it is that this just gives me the length of this vector in Euclidean space. That's going to be a useful property of Hilbert space, that I get the same space back. Now, if I have L infinity, then, well, the largest I can make my inner product is if I point it into the same quadrant, so the sign match. And it's basically the sum over the coordinates in the x and y direction. That's the one. That's just the lens of the parity. Well, the yeah. Well, so this is based, this maximizes the projection. Okay. So that's sorry. That's in, in infinity of the dual is a one. Okay. Now, if I have a unit ball, that's an L one ball. So they are all calibrated. If you were going to count pixels, they're all I think about two hundred pixels high, right? Um, so in this case, the best alignment that I can get is by picking this vector here my red vector, because you know, anything else here would be smaller. And then we'll just pick out the largest coefficient. So what actually happens is that the dual here of the L in L1 ball is the L infinity. Now, this actually holds in general. So in general, what holds is that if I have an LP space, then the dual of that is going to be an LQ space with a property that 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1. Furthermore, what we can also see is that by definition of this dual norm, we have a cauchy schwarz inequality. So we have that U dot V is less equal than the norm of U times the norm of me. Because I can always go and pull out the unit lengths of u. And then I say, well, now let, let's relax this and just find the largest guy that gives me the norm on the v's. And that gives me exactly cauchy schwarz but in Banach spaces and the dual space. Okay. If you've never seen this before, this might look really weird. But it's a very nice mechanism to get norms from norms. Any questions? Yeah? Which norms are applied during that Cauchy Schwarz inequality? Um, doesn't it holds for all the spaces and their dual spaces? So properly written, this would be Banach space B, and this is B star, which is the dual space. Yeah, by definition it holds. Now, what you can show is that the dual of an LP space is an LQ space. And that gives you Hilbert's inequality. So Hilbert's inequality is a special case of, you know, Cauchy-Schwarz for band spaces. 
And you can design a lot more bizarre spaces than LP spaces. Turns out that the, the value of P is actually meaningful. As in there's something called a type constant of a Banach space, which tells you a little bit how its geometry is behaved like. And basically for values of P between one and two, it actually matches beyond two, you enter a different regime. And again, that would be something you should take a functional analysis class to enjoy. Uh, now, um, what you can also do is you can design operator norms. Right? So you just repeat the same strategy as what we had before. Before we basically say, well, you know, we map, you know, we take norms of vectors by or linear functionals by just looking at where they are the largest. And for operators, well, which map from one Banach space to another one, I just take an inner product with two vectors that I can now optimize over and to make sure that, you know, that term is the largest. So for L2 in the Euclidean space, that will actually give me the largest singular value of the matrix. I could also design a lot of different norms that may or may not be easily expressible like this, like the trace norm. That's the sum over the actually absolute values of the singular values. Or the Frobenius norm, when you go and sum over all the squared entries in that matrix. And sometimes these are more useful to deal with. But generally, yeah, these are, you know, useful objects that we'll actually be playing with occasionally. So in the operator now, do you want to normalize it somehow? Um, it's, it's calibrated by simply, okay, so actually what I should have written here is uh, under the constraint that the norm of u is less equal than 1, mm -hmm. and here the norm of v is less equal than 1. You're absolutely right. Thanks. Thanks for paying attention. This is great. Great. Um, so, what you, yeah, so, so if, I, if my matrix is positive semi-infinite, the trace norm, so that means it has to be symmetric anyway, the trace norm of that matrix is trivial, it's just a trace. Now, why is it called a dual space? It actually has something to do with our, you know, the, you know, the Grange function and you know, duality and all that. So, let's just briefly introduce the Fenchel Legendre dual. This is a quantity that is occasionally quite useful, especially in optimization. So, if star of some function of v is the sum over all u in a product between u and v minus f of u. Now, if f is convex, then, you know, I can possibly solve that problem. Furthermore, you can easily see that f star of v is a convex function. Because for any u, this is a linear function, it's an affine function, v. And by taking a super over them, it's still convex. So f is defined now v and f star is defined on v star. Correct. Now, this is the other nice thing, that I can just pick a very special function. This is the indicator function on the unit ball. So it basically is zero within the unit ball and is infinity up here. That's a convex function. I mean, it's a very crazy one, but I can, you know, use that. I can ask, you know, what's the faintly genre dual of that indicator function on the unit ball? Well, it turns out this actually happens to be a norm. So that's a useful thing. Well, I'm just defining it this way. Because if it were to equal 1, then things might diverge. So that's, that's simply why. So, I mean, you know, I'm free to dream up any function I want. Uh, it just so happens that this particularly crazy dream makes, it, makes sense in the dual. So, now, sorry. This is sorry. Yes. Conjugate function. So yeah, this it's a conjugate. Yeah, yes, conjugate, conjugate, conjugate. Yes, yeah, that's what they're also called. So, here's a translation table. 
And for a couple of years, this used to be a good recipe for coming up with new algorithms and new papers. We take a statistics paper from the 60s, apply query replace of this. You have a nonlinear algorithm. You need to modify it a little bit to make sure you have proper capacity control and all that. And once you do that, you're safe. So, the thing is, whenever we had in finite dimensional spaces vectors, so like linear functions, now we have functions. When we have matrices, we get operators. Vector spaces become bad spaces, or in some nice cases where B star equals B, it's a complete space. Norms are norms. Eigenvalues are eigenvalues. The eigenvectors become eigenfunctions, because we know that vector needs to be translated to function. Transpose just becomes the adjoint operator, symmetric matrices, self-adjoint operators, and whatever was finite dimensional tends to become infinite dimensional there. And of course a lot of things can go horribly wrong at the the boundaries, the edge cases of, you know, you know, we need to prove be careful to prove certain limits and there are beautiful counterexamples for things that are very intuitive in finite dimensions. But by and large, for the purpose of what we're doing here, you can just translate. And it's going to probably unscare a lot of kernel papers for you. Okay. Any questions so far? Good. Uh, so let's just recall from last week. So XOR, of course, can't be solved in two dimensions, and in three dimensions, we managed to do it easily. Um, so why would you? use kernels rather than feature maps. So uh, with feature extraction, you need to be actually an expert of the domain. In some cases, that may be worth it if you care a lot about computational speed. Then it pays to maybe hire a couple of people to solve a very special problem. Like for you know, search and recommendation, it pays to have a natural language processing team that knows which features are meaningful. Or you could use um, then, however, some of those features tend to be really expensive to compute. So what you can do is, instead, you just use a shotgun approach. Since you don't know exactly what you're aiming for, you just aim for everything. You compute a lot of those features and you just hope that you, know, you find a good one among them and that's that. So, <coughs> naively, we just you know, would express x into 5x. In some cases that's actually not so naive in very large scale problems. And in the kernel case we just, you know, compute the kernel function. So, let's see. This is something that we saw last week already. So, in two dimensions, 5x is x1 squared, <coughs> square 2, x1, x2, and x2 squared. Then the dot product just happens to turn out nicely x dot x prime squared. And this works for any polynomials of order d if you just go through the math. Now, let me briefly show, no, okay, we'll, we'll do it later when we have to verse a kernel, that certain products and sums are actually proper kernels. So, why would you actually bother about this? Because in some cases, computing polynomial attributes explicitly is really expensive. But through a kernel, you can do it cheaply. And so the choice of which kernels people use are at one end determined by, well, you know, whatever is computationally very convenient. And at the other hand, obviously also, you know, what works well with, you know, some data in practice. And so different application domains have developed by now their own set of tools. So some of the kernels that are in, used in computer vision make a lot of sense in computer vision and look probably very bizarre for people not in computer vision. Same thing for sequence analysis, bioinformatics and so on. So, polynomial kernel, we already saw that last time. It's basically just a matter of expanding terms. And then all we need to check is that these are proper kernels. And I'm going to prove that for you in a moment. And yeah, these are all the negative numbers. So we're saying. Um, now, when does it matter? Well, we want to be able to actually compute k efficiently. And that's, is it, that's the key criterion. 
and it better be you know, useful in the sense that you know those kernels correspond to function classes are nice and smooth and we'll get to the regularization theory part in a moment. An obvious thing is well you know you want to make sure that k of x and x prime is symmetric. So they're no product, the Hilbert's based, so I have to be able to swap the arguments. However, it's not a given that this thing that any symmetric function of two arguments is going to be a prime. Another obvious condition is that k of x and x always has to be greater or equal than zero because lengths of vectors can never be negative. But you actually want to have a nice, nest sense, efficient condition for things to be in the product, and that's addressed by Mercer's theorem. Yeah. When you define this kernel to be a dot product, so you're asking, is there always a phi such that can yes. be a dot product? Correct. So basically, I can attack the problem in two ways. I can either say, well, let me dream up some set of attributes and I compute an inner product and then I do a little bit of algebra and I show that what I get out of it is easily computable. That's one direction. And that's a very productive direction. The opposite direction is I pick some function k of x and x prime. I prove that this function is a kernel in some space. And then I just run experiments and say, gee whiz, it works. I have no idea exactly what I'm doing, but gee whiz, it works. And this used to be a very popular approach. And so, of course, you're asking then, you know, are there moderately straightforward tools that let me take a kernel and find out what it does? Or vice versa, take some sequence expansion and find a corresponding kernel for it. And we're going to spend probably the next hour on looking into this in a lot more detail and what it means in terms of computation. So the key theorem, we're going to use is this one. So for any symmetric function k of two arguments, which is square integrable, and which satisfies that k of x and x prime times f of x times f of x prime, the x dx prime, is greater equal than zero for all f. I can find a kernel expansion. But if for any such k, I can find an expansion of k of x and x prime, sum over lambda i, these are the eigenvalues, phi i of x, phi i of x prime. Obviously, if I have such an expansion, this has to hold, right? Because that's an inner product, so that's that's trivially true. But just, you know, summation rearrangement. So I just pull the double integral into the sum and down. And yeah, I'm not worried about conversions of integrals and all that here. So all the things that you would worry about as a righteous mathematician, I'm just going to throw them by the wayside for the benefit of being a bit more expedient. But yes, you need to worry about that. <coughs> so but in theory. So, uh, but this is now a condition that's sometimes reasonably easy to change. And what it really means is that this double integral is really this continuous version of a vector matrix, vector multiplication, right? It basically is the continuous version of saying that the final matrix for any realization has to be positive. So from that, we immediately see that any Gaussian process kernel has to satisfy Mercer's condition. So distances in feature space. Well, so that's basically what I promised you before that we were going to go through things in a bit more detail. Um, yeah. So distance between two points, just, you know, far of x minus far of x prime squared. That's the square distance. Now I can just expand that because, you know, we have that inner product. Just get far of x and far of x. Minus tau to far of x, far of x prime plus the, the, the term on the x primes. Now, I know what these things are evaluated to with the kernel function. So, let's take a simple example, Gaussian RBM. For Gaussian RBM, we know that k of x in the x is 1. Right? So therefore, 
this equals 1 and that equals 1. So therefore, it follows that the distance between 5x minus 5x prime squared is 2 times 1 minus e to the minus 1 over 2 sigma squared norm of x minus x prime norm squared. Okay. Now this just so happens in Taylor expansion, right? This is basically nothing else than 1 over sigma squared x minus x prime plus, and then I have minus, and then I have you know, i going from 2 to infinity minus 1 to the i, and then here we have x minus x prime norm squared, so we have 2 here, where 2 sigma squared the entire term to the i. So what you can see is that in first order approximation, so locally, the distance in Hilbert space behaves exactly like the distance in the original space. And only at larger distances, that larger distance is squished, and it will never exceed 2. It makes a lot of sense because if everything is on my ball, Hilbert space, one point is here, another one is there, and this ball has radius one, then the largest distance I can get between any two points is two. That's exactly what I want. Okay. So features. Has to live in a space? Well, the features live in a Hilbert space, yes. And one way of looking at this feature map is also to say I'm mapping from data into a Hilbert space directly. And there are various views of it. I can, and they are equivalent. One is to consider a map from, well, x into 5x. Another map is from x into kernel function k of x and dot. And those two are actually equivalent. We'll get to that in a moment. So this is a bizarre object, right? We're mapping from you know a smiley face into a function that takes another smiley face as an argument. Here we're mapping from a smiley face to you know whatever features I might compute over smiley faces. So the later one could be efficiently more efficient than the first one. They are they actually um, you will typically never want to really touch phi of x directly. You will only want to play with inner products. Mm -hmm. There are some exceptions. So for instance for hash kernels, you're actually well advised to work with this directly. In some cases, you're really well off to actually work with the inver inverses of coherence matrices. So we'll see that this is the case for graphs. So if you want to do social networks inference, the inverse of the graph of Poisson can be a very useful tool, or actually the graph of Poisson itself. So it really depends on the specific setting. And so I'm going to walk you afterwards through a couple of tools on how to do computation efficiently for different kernels and for different contexts. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was our kernel matrix. And of course, yeah, this is also similar to matrix. That, that should be minus 2k x, x prime, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. That should be an x prime. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Typo. Um, now, the fact that k is positive semi-definite, we already saw as a proof last time. So let's just walk through the algebra again. So it's just, you know, sum over alpha i, alpha j, k i j. And then I just write the kernel as an inner product in Hilbert space. I push the summation into the inner product, which I can do because it's a bilinear form. 
Then I realized that the first and the second argument of that inner product are actually the same. So I can get that as a home squared, and I'm home. The really cool thing is that if I have a linear combination in Hilbert space, some of alpha i file fix i, and I want to take an inner product with some other file links. With w is exactly this, as what I get from my support vector expansion. Then I can revert that argument and pull the inner product inside here. And so I get sum over alpha i k of x i links. So what you can see is that in some cases it's advantageous to work with a final function. In some cases it's advantageous to work with a feature strict. And when, which is the case, really depends on your problem. There is no general rule. I wish there were one. But, um, so here's an example of you know, a kernel that's a really bad idea. So let's just take you know kernel k of x and x prime. And it's one if you know the two points are close, and it's zero otherwise, right? Sounds like a sensible function, right? It's a good similarity measure. Well then let's just take three points, you know, locations one, two, and three, and compute that kernel. That's a kernel matrix. And here we have zero split up space distance between one and three, and three and one is greater than one. And if I then just you know plug that into you know, Python or MATLAB or whatever and compute the eigenvalues, things go horribly wrong here. This is less than zero times three. In other words, this is not a kernel. Now, uh, sometimes people come up with functions of two arguments and then they actually use them and they claim that the algorithm works really well and then you prove that actually they didn't use a kernel. This for instance was the case for the hyperbolic tangent. So we had something of the form. And the question then was, you know, is this ever going to be a kernel? Because I mean, that gives you sort of the neural networks expression. And it turns out it never is. Um, that proof, yeah, it took me about seven years until I found that proof. And it was in a, an old paper by Schoenberg from 1934. And we'll probably look a little bit at how it works. The bottom line is, if you have both kernel functions which depend on inner products between two arguments do a Taylor expansion in this term if all the coefficients in the Taylor expansion are not negative you're safe if even one of them is negative you're screwed C has to be greater than zero in this case right? well it actually it's, it's never a kernel for none for no choice of C yeah I mean uh, and Proving that basically requires that you perform an expansion in spherical harmonics. So uh, basically, you use maple. You don't do it by hand. Um, an interesting thing is that if I have the following kernel, x dot x prime raised to the power of d, and d is not an integer, then this isn't a kernel either, which is a very bizarre situation. A lot of those things are not quite as intuitive as you would think. The negative just means you have a nice grand trace on the diagonal. That yeah, doesn't well, you have. What do you have? Well, I mean, no, you might. Well, I mean, I mean, if you have a negative entry of the diagonal, you're screwed anyway. Yeah. But uh, what's slightly more subtle to detect is if you have negative eigenvalues. Yeah. And that basically means that you know your capacity control, your regularization will go haywire. Because it actually encourages you estimator to overemphasize directions of you know negative i the negative eigenvectors. And that's really bad. So let's have a look at some kernels. We've already seen some of them, we've seen the linear one, Laplace, RBF, polynomial, B spline, you may or may not have seen that one. So that's just you convolve the indicator function with itself 
And for an odd number of convolutions, this is the kernel, for an even one it isn't. We'll actually see in a moment why that's the case. For the moment, the rule of thumb is you take the Fourier transform of any of those functions here, which depend on the difference, and you look at the spectrum. The spectrum is all non-negative, you're saying. Everybody's seen the line. Most people have probably seen the Laplacian. Everybody here has seen the Gaussian. It's a phenomenon of order three. The B spline that probably you may or may not have seen. Yes, you did if you saw, I think, the second lecture where we showed that this actually converges to a Gaussian. And that actually in this context shows that B splines of odd, odd order for large order will converge to a Gaussian or wave kernel. What we did is we looked a little bit at prior knowledge, regularization, and so on. And I hope that kernels by now are a little bit less mysterious. So I think now is actually a good time to have take a short break. I'll just I'll just show this slide. And, uh, I didn't make this up. Even though apparently you can come up with those things. I just did a Google image search for regularization, and somebody apparently decided to make that, uh, well, picture, right? 